morning. Today is February 10th, 2022, and welcome to the New Possibilities Hour, part of the Will Work for Food project founded by Natalie Armstrong Motan in the spring of 2020. Each week we bring you a cutting edge webinar on topics related to mediation, negotiation, arbitration, and lawyering. And we don't charge for these great webinars. Rather, we ask you to contribute to a food bank if you like what you see. And every week, one of my favorite parts of the webcast here is when we announce the running total of how much our generous audiences have contributed so far to food banks around the world in honor of our wonderful speakers and their tremendous presentations. Jean, would you please give us the update? With pleasure. Uh, we're, we keep coming up to that, getting closer to that uh, quarter of a million dollar mark. But uh, the number today, the donations of which we know, $236,346. So that's somewhere two, two and a half million meals. And that's just fantastic. Thank you all. Wow, unbelievable. Thanks so much to our speakers for giving these wonderful presentations. And thanks so much to our generous audiences for contributing so much to fight food insecurity all around the world. Today, we really have a special treat, one of the true titans of the fields of negotiation and mediation is with us, Professor Robert Manukin of Harvard Law School. Bob is the Samuel Williston Professor of Law at HLS, and for 25 years, he served as the chair of the program on negotiation at Harvard Law School. He directs the Harvard Negotiation Research Project. Bob is a leading scholar in the field of conflict resolution, he has applied his interdisciplinary approach to negotiation and conflict resolution to a remarkable range of problems, both public and private. When we invited Bob to speak on the New Possibilities Hour, we invited Bob to think big and help us think through some significant issues in negotiation. And I don't think you can get much bigger than trying to think through the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and whether there's a way to resolve that. If anybody can guide us through that, Bob Manukin is the one. Bob, please tell us a little bit about the food bank that's important to you and then take it away with your presentation. My friend, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Jess. Uh, what a pleasure to be here. And I just want to commend you and your team uh, for the remarkable efforts you've made on behalf of food banks. Uh, it's really so ironic that in the United States today, uh, there is such substantial food insecurity. And the food bank that uh, I'd like today to sponsor is the Boston Food Bank uh, in my own area of Boston. Uh, Boston in many ways now is booming. Uh, it's really become a, a great uh, high tech hub in terms of the new biology and, and medicine. And yet notwithstanding this remarkable prosperity where housing prices, uh, probably like here in California as well, are going through the roof, uh, there are just thousands who suffer from food insecurity. So it's really my pleasure to help support uh, your uh, very worthy enterprise. What I'd like to talk about during the next few minutes is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And I'd like to use it in a way to illustrate a few core concepts uh, in negotiation. Uh, I've actually uh, written a fair amount about this conflict. And apart from my academic work, I've also participated as a neutral in several uh, what are called track two efforts involving Israeli and Palestinian leaders meeting off the record. Uh, we've had such meetings in uh, Norway, uh, uh, as well as in the Middle East, uh, to try to promote uh, settlement. Uh, uh, I, I have to confess uh, that I've not been sitting by the phone waiting for the Nobel Committee to call me uh, for my peace efforts. Uh, I too have found this to be quite an intractable conflict. Uh, but I'd like to really begin by describing what I think is a paradox. I'm gonna to try to share my screen now. 
and uh, you can tell me if this works. I'd like to begin by identifying what I think is a paradox. And that is many analysts, myself included, are of the view that there are really possible two state deals that would better serve a majority of both Israelis and Palestinians than the continuation of the conflict. And yet, notwithstanding considerable efforts over the past 30 years, uh, negotiations have failed. And I guess the question is, why? These prior efforts, I mean, the Oslo Accords, believe it or not, were almost 30 years ago. Uh, they, you know, there, there was the initial uh, announcement in the White House in 1993 uh, during the first year of the Clinton administration. And since then, uh, American presidents uh, have put in enormous efforts to mediate and try to promote settlement. And apart, apart from American efforts, uh, Tony Blair, uh, the UN, there have been all kinds of international efforts as well. And I've just listed some of them here. I'm not going to try to go through uh, uh, the aspects of these various efforts. But I think that there, there's probably been no international conflict to which there has been so much effort given where the conflict has proven so intractable. Now, I think that what I believe is that there is a two-state deal that would better serve the interests of most Israelis and Palestinians than continued conflict. And in fact, I think there have been over the years polling data, you know, that suggests that percentages basically in the 60% range of both Israelis and Palestinians uh, would ultimately vote to approve such a deal uh, if in fact they thought the other side would really abide by it. But of course, there's enormous mistrust between uh, uh, the two sides. In negotiation terms, I guess the question I want to pose, and I think it's a a question of some generality. In circumstances where there is a zone of possible agreement, where parties in fact could make themselves better off through a negotiated deal, why do negotiations fail? What are the barriers? And in fact, a good deal of my intellectual efforts over the past 30 years have been to explore these various barriers. And I think the wonderful thing about our field is that you can gain insights into these possible bar barriers from a variety of um, disciplines. Uh, no single discipline has a monopoly, but I think that in fact, one could understand strategic barriers often from the perspective of game theory and economics. Uh, uh, there are also cognitive barriers that I think are ex exposed very well by new work in cognitive psychology. There are social psychological barriers as well that social psychologists have developed. Uh, and in fact, there is hardly a discipline that may not be able to provide insights into the question of why, in fact, under circumstances where parties can make themselves better off, do negotiations so often fail? And I want to apply that in the next few minutes very briefly. Uh, to this conflict. In the road ahead, what I'm going to first do is describe the so-called final status issues. What are the questions that were identified, in fact, by the Oslo Accord uh, that have to be resolved as part of a two-state resolution? Next, I'm going to briefly desc describe the outline of a deal the kind of deal that the conventional wisdom suggests at least uh, would probably make a majority of Israelis and Palestinians better off. Uh, it's a deal really based on the so-called Clinton parameters identified uh, by President Clinton uh, in the Camp David negotiations uh, that occurred in late 2000, just before he left office. <clears throat> 
Next, I'm going to identify the barriers, strategic, cognitive, uh, a barrier that's characterized as loss aversion, something that my colleague Lee Ross at Stanford called reactive devaluation. And then finally, what I view is perhaps the most important barrier of them all, and that is internal behind the table conflicts within each side. I'm going to just see if I can get my uh, slide to move. Hmm. It finally got it to move. Uh, let me begin by outlining the so-called final status issues. The first issue, which is obviously conspicuous, is if you're going to have two states, what is going to be the border between the two states? What is going to be the territory occupied by each of the two states? The next big question is what happens to the Israeli settlements in the West Bank? Uh, presently, there are over half a million Israeli Jews living in the West Bank. And if there's a two-state resolution, what becomes of those settlements? A third big question relates to Palestinian refugees. Uh, as a result, of the 1948 war establishing Israel and the subsequent wars in 1967 and 73, uh, there are today millions of Palestinian refugees, uh, many of whom are now living, in fact, not in Gaza or the West Bank, but outside the Middle East. A big question is what happens to these refugees? What rights do they have to return to the region, to reclaim what were their homes? A fourth question is Jerusalem. And Jerusalem, of course, is of enormous importance to all three of the great monotheistic uh, religions, uh, uh, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Uh, all three have sacred sites in Jerusalem. And uh, the question is, what happens to Jerusalem? How is it governed? And then the final big question relates to Israel's security. Uh, Israel geographically is a tiny country. Uh, and in fact, it's embedded in the Middle East uh, where there are a number of uh, nations nearby that are extremely hostile, some of whom are really even devoted uh, to the destruction of the Jewish state. Uh, Israel views uh, its continued occupation of the West Bank of enormous strategic importance in terms of its own self-protection. What would be the provisions relating to Israel's security uh, that might uh, lead to uh, a resolution that was acceptable to Israelis? Now, needless to say, these five issues are extremely complicated. Uh, and uh, there aren't easy resolutions of any of them. However, there really are uh, possible deals that I think are feasible uh, that could lead to a successful two-state resolution. Now, the conventional wisdom as to what these elements are really relate to what's called the Clinton parameters. Uh, they were outlined, believe it or not, uh, in, way back in 2000, just before uh, President Clinton left office. Uh, and they really had the following elements. First, the core idea was there would be two sovereign states for two people, a Palestinian state which would be the homeland of the Palestinian people, and Israel, which would remain a Jewish state uh, for uh, uh, the Jewish people. Borders, what would be the borders? Uh, the starting place that uh, President Clinton suggested 
uh, were the so-called 67 borders, the Green Line. Uh, the Green Line is not a formal international border. It was in fact established after Israel's War of Independence uh, as a, a temporary border uh, and uh, uh, separating uh, Israel uh, from uh, the West Bank uh, and Gaza. And the idea is that the 67 border would be the starting place, but there would then be geographic adjustments. And the adjustments would involve land swaps uh, of roughly about 6% of the total territory. And what land swaps would permit is the absorption into Israel proper of the vast majority of Jewish settlers who are now on the West Bank. Most of the most populated West Bank settlements are quite close uh, to the Green Line, uh, which means that in fact, it would be possible to have a contiguous Palestinian state where in fact, as I said, some 6% of the territory would be absorbed into Israel proper in exchange for an equivalent amount of land that is presently part of Israel that would become part of the new Palestinian state. And the advantage of this is the vast majority of Israeli settlers would not have to move, but could, they already are of course Israeli citizens, but they could be absorbed into Israel proper uh, and um, uh, uh, without displacing. The notion though of the Clinton parameters is those Israeli settlements that were not part of this territorial exchange uh, would be substantially evacuated. Uh, and the Israelis living there would be reabsorbed into Israel proper. Uh, there might well be a possibility uh, that with the permission of the Palestinian state. Uh, some might be permitted to stay uh, in the West Bank, but they would of course be subject to the governance uh, of the West Bank. Uh, um, uh, <clears throat> With respect to Jerusalem, the idea is that Jerusalem would become the capital of both Israel. Uh, Israel has long claimed that Jerusalem is its capital. And as you all know, uh, during the Trump administration, the United States uh, recognized uh, Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, but most other countries internationally have not formally recognized uh, Jerusalem as the Israeli capital. But Jerusalem would also be the capital of the new Palestinian state. It turns out that within Jerusalem proper, most neighborhoods, are either exclusively occupied by Jews or exclusively occupied by Palestinians. And the idea is, uh, the idea is that the Jewish parts of Jerusalem would of course be governed by Israel and the Palestinian portions of Jerusalem would be, occupied, would be uh, governed uh, by the new Palestinian state. Uh, the religious sites uh, in fact uh, would be uh, for the most part, either internationalized or the Muslim sites might be controlled by the Palestinian state and the Jewish sites would be controlled uh, by, by the Jewish state uh, and some might be uh, controlled by both. In essence, I think the core idea is that Jerusalem would be a little bit like a condominium. And in a condominium, uh, individual owners own the interior space uh, where uh, uh, they have ownership rights, but there are common areas uh, that are jointly governed by the condominium association. And the idea for Jerusalem, the, the, the proposed solutions uh, are analogous to this. Finally, with respect to Palestinian refugees, uh, as you know, uh, Palestinians claim a right of return. Uh, the argument 
is that Palestinian refugees, so the Palestinians claim, uh, have a right to return uh, to where now for most of the Palestinian refugees, you know, they're second or third generation refugees, they never in fact ever lived in Israel proper, but they might have grandparents who did, or even great grandparents who did. And the Palestinians have long claimed a right of return, that they have a legal right under international law uh, to, to return uh, to what historically was their home in 1948. Uh, uh, the Israeli government has long rejected this notion. Well, the idea is refugees, Palestinian refugees, would have a right to return to the new Palestinian state, but not necessarily Israel proper. Uh, most peace proposals uh, might include small numbers uh, that Israel could control that would permit some Palestinian refugees to return to Israel proper, but the overwhelming majority would have a right to return not to Israel at all, but to the new Palestinian state. Also, uh, the notion is that in the international community, a number of states around the world uh, would uh, also permit uh, Palestinian refugees to become citizens and to permanently reside in these uh, other states as well. Finally, with respect to security, the core notion is that the new Palestinian state would be substantially demilitarized. They would of course have uh, the right to control their own police, uh, uh, to maintain uh, internal civil authority, uh, but uh, they would not have a substantial standing army, nor would the new Palestinian state be permitted to enter uh, into uh, uh, treaty agreements uh, with countries that were hostile to Israel. Uh, in terms of Jordan and the Jordan Valley, uh, which, is, which involves uh, uh, the most Eastern portion of the West Bank, uh, most proposals include some international military presence in the Jordan Valley to protect Israel uh, from a possible uh, uh, invasion uh, uh, from the east. Anyway, the, these are the so-called Clinton parameters. And none of these involve kind of simple issues. They aren't simple. But on the other hand, it's not as if no one can kind of uh, spell out, even in considerable detail, what the elements of a two-state deal are. And yet, as earlier noted, it's been impossible through negotiations uh, to reach uh, this kind of agreement. Now, this poses the core question that I set out at the outset. Why here, under circumstances where it is possible, and it's long, they've, it's long been identified, uh, that there is uh, a two-state resolution, uh, have, has it proven, has the dispute proven so intractable? Let me suggest what some of the barriers might be. A first barrier, you know, is really based on the notion of even how uh, rational self-serving actors sometimes uh, behave in negotiation. And that is they engage in hard bargaining tactics. They make threats, they bluff, uh, they stake out positions uh, which, they're not, which they claim they're not prepared to, to move from. Well, I can assure you in the Middle East, there are lots of people that have had a lot of experience with so-called hard bargaining. We've all seen lots of conflicts where because parties are engaging in hard bargaining, they never in fact are able to reach a deal, even though there are possible deals uh, 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 that might better serve them. They're each holding out for a larger share of, of the gains that might be achieved from that deal. Uh, as I teach my students, and as you all know, in any negotiation, there are always distributive issues where more for one party means less for the other. Now, I'm deeply committed, as I'm sure many of you are too, 
to the notion that in most negotiations, there are also opportunities to expand the pie, to create value. Even though value can be created though, no matter how big the pie gets, you still have distributive issues. Who's going to get what portion of the pie? Jeff and I, for example, might form a partnership where because of complementary skills, together we're able to uh, achieve much greater success than either of us could have achieved individually. Nevertheless, in our partnership agreement, we've still got to resolve the question of in terms of the now much greater total profits, what share does he get? What share do I get? And often, a focus on the distributive issues uh, is so intense and parties can so engage in strategic bargaining where they make threats, et cetera. They uh, uh, claim uh, that they make so-called final offers that they fail to reach an agreement even though they might be better off. So one reason, even in circumstances where parties can make themselves better off, uh, uh, Strategic bargaining uh, can lead to impasse. Another problem uh, in terms of bargaining is that parties often have self-serving biases. Uh, in negotiations, if you add, if you ask litigants, uh, for example, uh, before cases are going to court, before the actual trial. What do you think the odds are that you're gonna win? Uh, what you see is uh, that in fact, if you add up the percentage that the plaintiff thinks he's gonna, that the odds that he'll win uh, to the odds that the defendant thinks uh, uh, she'll win, it adds up to much more than 100% because each party often has a biased view of how, for example, in a legal dispute, that the neutral judge is likely to decide. Uh, this has been shown in uh, lots of experiments, uh, many by uh, Professor Lowenstein, uh, but th this notion of, of, of biased estimates of what the outcome will be if you don't make a deal uh, can of course lead to impasse because if I think I have an 80% chance of winning in court, uh, and uh, uh, Jean thinks that she's got a 70% chance of winning in court, no negotiated offer that either of us is gonna make is gonna be acceptable to the other because we're both assessing the odds of what will happen if we go to court very differently. I think that, uh, 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 it is uh, a, a true in this uh, uh, a conflict as well. I think the Palestinians believe that in the long run, they're likely to prevail uh, because their population may be increasing faster. Uh, and the Israelis think that they're gonna prevail because they have such security superiority. Uh, and I think both of them uh, have biased perspectives of uh, uh, the other side. Another, and I think very interesting uh, barrier is what is called loss aversion. Uh, this is based on my former, former colleague, Amos Tversky and his partner, uh, Kahneman's work uh, in terms of cognitive psychology. It turns out that if a resolution involves an immediate loss to a party, it also involves substantial potential gains. Loss aversion is the notion that in terms of decision-making, people often put much too much emphasis on the loss. And for example, in this dispute, what is so conspicuous is that the conventional deal that I've identified imposes substantial losses on each party. It also has potential gains because it means the end of the conflict, 
and the possibility of even greater economic prosperity in the future. But think about the losses. For Palestinians, for whom, you know, for now more than 50 years, there's been an emphasis on this so-called right of return. The idea that someday they were gonna be able to return and reclaim their homes within Israel proper. Uh, the two-state deal means an end of that dream. There will be no right to return to Israel proper or what is now Israel proper. And for many Palestinians, that would be viewed as a terrible loss. Uh, for Israelis, on the other hand, there is a minority of Israelis for whom their life's dream is the creation of what they call Eretz Israel, an Israel that includes the West Bank. During biblical times, by the way, the Jews did not occupy the coast. Tel Aviv was never a center of Jewish life in biblical times. It was, in fact, largely in the West Bank uh, that, in fact, uh, the ancient Hebrews lived, the biblical Hebrews lived. And uh, for uh, religious Israelis, for whom the settlement of the West Bank is a actually a, a duty, a religious duty, they view it as a religious duty, giving up the dream of this greater Israel, Eretz Israel, uh, involves a terrible loss, a real sacrifice. Now, only a minority of Israelis uh, really have a religious commitment to the occupation of the West Bank. But for many more Israelis, uh, that dream has some resonance, and that too involves a loss. So I guess one barrier here uh, is each side feels the intensity, or at least minorities within, substantial minorities within each side, feel uh, uh, such an intense feeling of loss uh, if they made the conventional deal uh, that they represent uh, real opposition uh, to such a deal. Another element is what my former Stanford colleague, Lee Ross, called reactive devaluation. Let me describe what reactive devaluation is. And I'm gonna describe it from the perspective of uh, many, many years ago when I was in practice. I remember I was representing a client uh, in litigation. And uh, on a uh, Monday, the client says to me, Manukin, if somehow we could settle this case and the defendant would simply pay me at least $75,000, I would be delighted to be rid of it and get this case settled. Well, lo and behold, the next morning, before I could call the lawyer on the other side, uh, the defendant's lawyer calls me and he says, Bob, uh, we'd like to make an offer to you to settle. And that is, we'll pay you $80,000 to get rid of this case. Well, I said to the lawyer on the other side, I really appreciate that offer. I take it as a serious offer. I will consult with my client and get back, at, get back to you. I, of course, was smiling. I thought, my God, we've got this case resolved. I call my client and I say, Fred, you'll never guess what happened. This morning, before I could call the lawyer on the other side, he called me and he offered $80,000 so we can get this resolved. Silence on the other end of the line. And finally, my client says, well, what's he know that we don't know? <laughs> in other words, now that his adversary made an offer that met what he had previously said would serve his interests better than continuing litigation. He now is devaluing the offer just because the offer was made 
by the adversary. I'll tell you a secret that many of you have probably already experienced as mediators. To avoid reactive devaluation, often as a mediator, what I do is at some point after talking to the parties, et cetera, put an offer on the table as a mediator's offer. <laughs> now, often that mediator's offer, in fact, is something that one side or the other has already suggested to me. It's not necessarily my creativity at all, but by making it a mediator's offer rather than an offer coming from the adversary, it sometimes makes it more acceptable. And that is because of reactive devaluation. The idea that the very offer of a concession or proposal from an adversary may diminish its value or attractiveness in the eyes of the recipient if that recipient is caught too much in what I call a zero sum mindset. Finally, I wanna to come to what I think is the most substantial reason that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is intractable. And that is because of internal conflicts behind the table. Uh, within Palestine, within, among Palestinians, think about how intense the internal conflicts are. Uh, in fact, the conflicts among Palestinians between, for example, Fatah, which is in charge of the Palestinian Authority and the governance of the West Bank, and Hamas, which is responsible for Gaza, that internal conflict has at times led to the equivalent of a civil war among Palestinians. Uh, I, I remember uh, at the beginning of uh, Secretary of State Kerry's initiative in 2014, I said to Martin Indyk, uh, an extraordinarily gifted diplomat, I said to Martin, I said, suppose in your negotiations between the Palestinian Authority uh, and Abu Mazen on the one hand, and the Net Netanyahu government in Israel on the other hand, suppose you make a deal, describe to me how in the world you get it implemented in terms of uh, Hamas. Uh, after all, uh, the Palestinian Authority is not speaking for a substantial segment of Palestinians. And Martin looked at me and smiled and he said, yep, that's a big problem. <laughs> I'd say it's a big problem. Uh, on the Israeli side, of course, you've got a, an analogous problem. Uh, it has not quite led to the equivalent of near civil war, but there is an enorm enormous conflicts within Israel about the importance of the West Bank, the whole project uh, of, of the settlements. Uh, and uh, as you know, the Israeli government is always because of their internal governmental structure, a coalition government. And these coalitions usually have the narrowest kinds of margins. Uh, therefore, the challenge for an Israeli leader to be able to put together the behind the table coalition to make substantial concessions in order to reach a deal is extraordinarily difficult. And I think much too little attention has been paid by mediators to these internal conflicts within each side and what could be done to mitigate them. Because my own view is without mitigating them, the internal conflicts make the leadership challenge extraordinarily difficult. That's not to say that there might not be a leader on one side and the other at some moment in time who has this capacity to pull, <laughs> to manage the internal conflict. But I, I've seen no such leadership, <laughs> uh, at, at least during uh, recent years. Uh, and that, of course, uh, is uh, the terrible dilemma uh, 
I, I mean, it's clear to me that Abu Mazen is not such a leader, uh, uh, nor was Netanyahu. Well, one question, I guess, is uh, if the prospects, because of these barriers, make in the short run any kind of negotiated resolution based on a two-state solution, how about a single secular state with equal rights? Now, I have to say that for many of the Palestinian elite, particularly those who aren't particularly religious, this really is their first choice outcome. They'd love a single secular state with equal rights. Uh, now, in fact, there are all kinds of structural questions about what would be the structural characteristics of this one state. Would it be a federal scheme? Would it be a consociational democracy like Belgium? I don't have time today to go through what the elements of a consociational democracy are, but in, in Belgium, there is, by the way, there's a, 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 a part of Belgium is Flemish, uh, a part of it uh, where there are, which they, where they essentially speak Dutch, Flemish is the same as Dutch. Uh, and then there, the Walloon section, which is uh, where people speak French. And there's some territorial division within uh, Belgium. And these two communities, the French, the Francophones uh, and, and the uh, uh, Flemish uh, have rights to control their own education, et cetera. Uh, there are two regions, there are geographic divisions, and there are two peoples where they have language rights and education rights. It's enormously complicated. And I've spent a lot of time, I spent a, a, a semester and I visited Belgium uh, often. It's a wonderful country. And uh, I, uh, uh, by the way, the, the food is glorious and it's much less than costly than in France. Uh, and uh, Bruges and Ghent, uh, as well as Brussels are beautiful cities. I, I think Americans don't go to Belgium enough. So I, I like to promote Belgium. But whenever Palestinians say to me, oh, Belgium's the dream, I say, well, you better look more closely because Belgium essentially is almost ungovernable. Now it's part of the EU. And that conflict between the Flemish and the Walloons has never been violent. <laughs> but on the other hand, their governmental structure uh, is constantly at an impasse because there are mutual vetoes and everything else. And I, I, I view it as quite implausible that given the history of violence uh, that a consociational scheme uh, would work in terms of Israel and Palestine. Moreover, I think any single secular state uh, there is enormous internal disagreement among Israeli Jews about almost all issues. But I think the one thing you could say there is a strong consensus about is that they want Israel to be a Jewish state where the symbols are Jewish uh, and it could be viewed as the Jewish homeland. And I think the idea that Israel would voluntarily ever become a single secular state I think is entirely implausible uh, politically. So I guess I'm really uh, quite dubious uh, that the alternatives to a two-state solution have any real prospect. So what to do? I think the key thing to do is to keep hope alive for two-state resolution. And what that would involve is first, I think the American policy must be to discourage further Jewish settlement expansion on the West Bank, particularly in any kind of new settlements. I think it's critical that this be the American policy. And I really frankly wish, although I'm very committed to Israel's survival as a Jewish state, I frankly wish the United States would be much more vigorous in its opposition to the expansion of Jewish settlements. Uh, we in fact do have considerable leverage with respect to Israel, because the amount of military support that we're giving to Israel remains very substantial. Israel is in no way nearly so economically dependent on the United States as it once was, but we still have a lot of leverage. And we've been very reluctant to use that leverage, and I think we should. I think the other thing that we should do is instead of emphasizing any kind of immediate prospects for negotiation,
we ought to encourage Palestinian economic development uh, in the West Bank and in the Palestinian territories. And not only economic development, but also encourage the development of Palestinian political institutions. Uh, there's lots that can be done on the ground to improve the life of Palestinians and to start developing the institutions that of course are gonna be essential if there is to ultimately be a Palestinian state. In addition, we of course should encourage regional and international support for the two-state resolution. And uh, we should encourage both sides uh, to take unilateral initiatives, which are consistent uh, with the two-state resolution. There are things that in terms of policy that can be done on both sides that I think will do that. Finally, let me just close by sort of briefly outlining for you what I see as the Biden administration's current policy. The Biden administration, of course, remains and re is reaffirmed a two-state resolution. It, it has not reversed the Trump decisions on Jerusalem or the Golan Heights, where uh, Jerusalem was declared the um, capital of Israel. Uh, and the goal on heights, uh, uh, the United States recognized Israel's sovereignty over the goal on heights. I don't think that did much harm because I think that the idea that Israel for security reasons would ever give up the goal on heights, uh, given uh, the proximity to Syria is absolutely implausible. Uh, the Abrahamic Accords with the Emirates and the other Gulf states, of course, the Biden administration is supporting those accords, uh, which was an achievement of the Trump administration. And the Biden administration is opposing settlement expansion. Uh, I think that it uh, should oppose settlement expansion even more vigorously, but it is opposing them. Uh, the Biden administration renewed aid to the Palestinians and has reestablished relations with the Palestinian Authority. The Trump administration had broken off both. I think the Biden administration will vehemently oppose any attempts by Israel to annex portions of the West Bank and would take actions to prevent that. I think the Biden administration opposes the so-called BDS movement in the United States. Uh, but I do not think that the Biden administration is gonna push for the resumption of talks directed towards a two-state resolution because I think they correctly perceive its chances for progress now are almost nil. And finally, I have to say that I don't think the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is a top foreign policy priority anymore. I don't think it's a top priority in the Middle East uh, compared to Iran and, and uh, compared uh, to problems uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan. And internationally, it certainly isn't a priority in comparison uh, to what's going on with Russia now with Ukraine and United States concerns uh, with uh, China. So I think we're gonna be hearing less about this dispute uh, in the future. Uh, that's the end of my formal presentation. Uh, I'd be glad uh, to take a few questions. Uh, uh, and once again, uh, thank you uh, for this opportunity. Bob, uh, that was just fantastic and thorough, insightful. Thank you so much. And so much of what you said is fascinating how the same principles apply to everyday negotiations and the kinds of cases we might be negotiating or mediating. The same principles apply to these very significant international negotiations. There's a lot to learn here. Let me ask a couple of questions to start out. One has to do with neutrality. As mediators, we're supposed to be neutral. You tell us you've been involved in the mediation, negotiation of these conflicts. I think everybody knows that you're Jewish. You've written a book on uh, the situation of American Jewry. I've heard you speak publicly about the role of uh, Jewish identity in your own family. Given your own identification as Jewish, how do you establish and maintain uh, 
neutrality with both sides when you're involved in this situation? Well, I think that's a very good question. I think that uh, 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 it's true, and I'm, I make no bones about it uh, in my work, uh, that as an American Jew, uh, I am uh, committed to Israel's survival as a Jewish and democratic state. Uh, on the other hand, I'm also committed uh, to the notion that uh, uh, I, in fact, oppose, and I've been public in my opposition, to many policies of the Israeli government. And I think in, in terms of my uh, own dealings with Palestinians, uh, I, I make no bones about both. Uh, so in that sense, uh, I don't claim uh, that kind of I'm a tabla rasa and have no prior views on any of this. And I think the key thing and, and I, by the way, I think in international diplomacy, uh, the reason, for example, Palestinians have often wanted American presidents and American administrations to be deeply involved as mediators in this conflict is not because they believe the United States is neutral. They realize that uh, domestically in the United States. The United States is very favorably, more favorably inclined towards Israel than the Palestinians. Obviously, there's great diversity among Americans about their views. But the reason they want the United States to often act as a mediator is because if they ask themselves the question, who might be able to influence the Israeli government to change policies, it's because they think that, in fact, the United States probably has more leverage than anybody else. And that's probably true. And that's why I think the United States, in fact, does have a potentially indispensable role, not because they're neutral necessarily, but because uh, it's well known uh, that, uh, in fact, there is probably much more substantial domestic pressure within the United States that's favorable to Israel than is favorable to Palestinians. Uh, but I think that in the international domain, uh, when countries are acting uh, as mediators in disputes, uh, no one has any illusion that these countries don't have interests of their own. Uh, and, that, uh, uh, and I think that in that sense, it's not exactly like the role we play where when I'm a uh, act as a mediator in a commercial dispute or a family dispute, it's very important for me to disclose any prior connections with either side, with the lawyers on either sides, et cetera. And there's really an insistence on absolutely full disclosure of, of these conflicts. I don't think the same necessarily applies internationally at all. I think often. And indeed, what's interesting, I have often advised clients, they've worried that a potential neutral has a stronger relationship with one side, with the other side than they do with them. And I've said, I've often said to clients, look, in a mediation, you have the capacity to say no, there will be no decision imposed on you. And in fact, if the mediator is someone whom you think can really influence the other side to reach an achievement, don't be quite so concerned because it could be an advantage, in fact, for you to have a mediator that really has influence, all right? Uh, now, it's a very different story if you're talking about an arbitrator or you're talking about a judge. But for a mediator, you know, I, I think people often uh, exaggerate because they're confusing the role. Uh, they may exaggerate the importance of neutrality. Um, <clears throat> let me ask this additional question. Along with neutrality, the other pillar of mediation is self-determination. The party's preferences, the party's interests, needs, and values. Right. You seem pretty committed to the two-state solution as opposed to other potential resolutions of the situation. 
To what extent does your involvement honor and respect the principle of self-determination, or do you ever question whether your own views on this are getting in the way of your effectiveness in the negotiation? Well, I, I, I think that's a, that's a fair question. And I think that my own view is, if in fact the parties could structure and reach a resolution based on one state, uh, uh, I would say hallelujah. But my, my uh, it, it's not that I oppose it so much as I deeply believe it's absolutely infeasible. Because I think, as I said, although I think it would not be a hard sell to Palestinians, because having a single state that had the prosperity of Israel, and that was a democracy, and that was secular, uh, I think has, for many Palestinians, particularly Palestinian intellectuals, has enormous appeal. But I guess my own view is that among Israelis, it has zero chance of political acceptance. Uh, and it's that skepticism that leads me to oppose it. Not, it's not an opposition in principle. Uh, and uh, it, uh, I would be happy to be proved wrong, <laughs> uh, but it, it, it's really a pragmatic opposition. It's not an opposition in terms of principle. And I would, I, I, I of course, in terms of uh, 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 my work with Israelis and Palestinians, I'm prepared to be explicit about that and prepared to be corrected. And there are, of course, there's a minority of Israelis for whom it would be acceptable. Bob, I was also quite fascinated by <clears throat> your discussion of the need to pay attention to the behind the table interests, the internecine conflicts on each side. In our commercial cases, do you think mediators pay enough attention to that, to the issues that may be going on between lawyers and their own clients? What do you think we can do in more run-of-the-mill commercial cases uh, to address those issues? Well, I think that's a great question. And I think it's something to always keep in mind. You know, you've, you've identified another potential conflict and that is there are times where uh, the biggest barrier to a resolution is the conflict between the two lawyers, not between the executives. <laughs> and as mediators, I mean, one thing we sometimes do is of course, uh, I never try to sort of get between a lawyer and his or her client. But sometimes we do meet with the clients, with the executives without the lawyers present. Uh, and um, I, I, I think the other thing though that you're describing is a different kind of conflict. And that is where uh, there's a conflict behind the table uh, uh, within a company. For example, the finance group and the marketing group may be at loggerheads that prevent uh, uh, the creation of uh, uh, alternative options for resolution uh, that might in fact serve the interests of both. And in fact, I have to say that in my own mediation, I prefer working with the parties together, but an exception that I make, and this has happened on, on, on several occasions, is I will be asked to meet privately with executives of a company to really mediate an internal conflict within the company that is identified as a barrier to reaching agreement across the table. So I think that happens. And I think uh, mediators are quite right. Mediators should be alert to it. And uh, by asking questions, you can often uh, uh, find out about that. And companies are often very reluctant to expose those kinds of differences in front of the other side. But that is a circumstance where I think uh, caucusing uh, may well be essential. Okay, you can meet last question to you. We have just a minute left. Do you want to unmute yourself? Um, yeah, thank you for your excellent presentation. I was wondering what is your view on the benefits that the status quo has for different powers on the table um, in terms of being a barrier 
in resolving the country, the, the, the conflict. And this is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, I assume. Yes. Well, in fact, I think, I think a huge barrier is for the median Israeli voter, they are comfortable with the status quo. The median Israeli voter does not spend much time in the West Bank. They don't live in a settlement. Uh, and in terms of their day-to-day -day life, the conflict often doesn't affect them very substantially. Now, there are moments when it does. You know, for example, uh, when uh, from Gaza, they're shelling of Israel. Uh, and there's been a lot of that at times. That affects their lives a lot and brings uh, the conflict home. Uh, but uh, compared to the Palestinians, for whom their day-to-day -day life in terms of occupation it, it bears on their existence all the time, I think uh, a, uh, a bit of a dilemma is that an awful lot of Israelis are very comfortable with the status quo. And they may realize that in the long run, there's gonna be a need for change, but what I called loss aversion, the idea of the pain caused by uh, uh, the, the resolution, avoiding that uh, makes them willing to accept the status quo. Yeah, and I don't think it's just it's the Israelis, it's the Israeli government, it's um, Hamas, it's Iran supporting Hamas, and everyone is seems to be getting something out of this conflict, except for um, just normal Palestinian, Palestinian civilians. I, 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 think, I think you are right that uh, for Hamas, the continuation and indeed sometimes the intensification of the conflict they view as serving their own interests. I agree with that. Bob, thank you so much. I wish we had more time for all the questions that people have and all the wonderful discussion I know we could have, but our time is up and we've committed to you and everyone else to begin on time and end on time. So thank you so much, Bob Manukin. This has been one of our most stimulating and deep programs that we've had on the Will Work for Food Project New Possibilities Hour. We encourage everybody, if you're in a position to support the Greater Boston Food Bank or other food banks in your area, please do so. Hopefully we can make Bob Manukin the answer to what I know will become one of all time great trivia questions. Who was the speaker who put the Will Work for Food Project over a quarter of a million dollars? Let's make it Bob Manukin. Thank you all so much, Bob, all of our, uh, all of our attendees today, Jean, Natalie, Sarah, thank you all so much. We are complete. Jeff, thank you and your team. It was my pleasure. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. See you next week. Same time, same place. <laughs>